welcome back. I'm Matthew Brogdon. I'm the Senior Director of the Center for Constitutional Studies here. And for those of you who are just joining us, who might not have been in our earlier sessions, welcome to our annual Constitution Day Conference. The focus of which this year is Framing the Frontier, the Making of Western State Constitutions. This is among the panels, which is focused not just on Western state constitutions, but on the American state constitutional tradition more generally. And uh, if you were not in our last session, we had the, the, the pleasure of uh, a lecture from Professor John Dynan, uh, is Professor of Politics at Wake Forest University and the editor of Publius, the country's leading journal on federalism, both in the United States and abroad. Um, I say it's the leading journal because he's been kind enough to publish my work as well as others. <laughs> um, but uh, Professor Dynan gave us a, a, a really insightful tour de force of the whole question of when and how we should amend state constitutions. Should they be so easily amendable? How is the way we amend them and pursue formal change in state constitutions changed? Um, and how should we carry that forward? What's the ideal sort of difficulty level for amendments and procedures for carrying out those desired changes? A wonderful way to set an agenda for us. Um, I do want to introduce this panel because what we would like to do is take some of those questions and work through them. And uh, when I've introduced the panel, you'll see why we've assembled this group and why it's, um, why it's a very uh, apt group of scholars to tackle this question. I've already begun to introduce John Dynan, um, but John is also the author, we didn't mention this, in the, uh, the earlier panel, but he's the author of the American State Constitutional Tradition, uh, which is a, uh, like his lecture, um, a, uh, a remarkable overview of the American State Constitutional Tradition and keeping the people's liberties, legislators, citizens, and judges as guardians of rights, reminding us, um, as if you were here this morning, you remember uh, uh, Judge Jeff Sutton reminded us that as soon as we fall into the, the one narrative account that there's just courts and they protect rights and everything else is sort of set up against them, uh, reminding us that there's a, a different story to tell in American constitutionalism. Also joining us on the panel is Nicholas Cole. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Cole is a senior research fellow at Pembroke College, Oxford, and he is the creator of the Quill platform and the director of the Quill project, um, with whom we've been working these uh, several years now and uh, carrying forward the study of constitution making, especially at present in the American states. We also have Adam Brown, um, our dear colleague from down the road. He bleeds blue rather than green, uh, but he's from our brethren down at BYU. And uh, Adam is an associate professor of political science at BYU. He is also the author of, and I've thrown a book on the floor, he is also the author of The Dead Hand's Grip, How Long Constitutions Bind States, um, which is going to win the award for uh, most provocative title. Uh, he tells me that he argued with Oxford University Press for some time, that they put a sort of actual dead hand gripping a quill on the cover, and they felt like that was a little too, in his words, metal for Oxford. Anyway. Um, we also have Robinson Woodward Burns joining us from Howard University. Robinson is an assistant professor of political science at Howard, and he is the author of Hidden Laws, how state constitutions stabilize American politics. Uh, we have some questions about that. Um, and we have Brian Phillips Murphy joining us. He is an associate professor of history at Rutgers at the University at Rutgers University, Newark. He's also affiliated faculty with the Center for State Constitutional Studies there. And he is an expert on early US history, political economy, and legal history. 
He's the author of Building the Empire State, Political Economy in Early America. So you can see why I have been excited about this panel ever since we managed to put it together. Um, these are all folks who have thought quite seriously about what it is we do with state constitutions in America and what the consequences of that have been in American political and constitutional development and perhaps what those consequences will be as we carry forward the state constitutional tradition. So I'll just start with a very general question following up on John's talk, and we'll see who wants to have the first crack at it. Is the malleability of state constitutions a good thing in comparison with the state constitutional, or in comparison with the federal constitution? Uh, has this been, we can talk about this in historical perspective, has this been beneficial for American politics that state constitutions are so changeable and accessible to alteration? And will it continue to be so? It's an interesting question for somebody from the other side of the Atlantic because the British Constitution, as you may know, can be changed by ordinary statute law. Um, and in fact, we decided to secede from a large political union on the basis of a vote held one Thursday afternoon, uh, absolutely within the margin of error, where a change in the weather would probably have uh, resulted in a different vote. There's, there's really good political science uh, that that um, that says the weather changes votes by a few percent, um, and so on. Um, so it's interesting that, in a way, you know, you you can it's 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 easy to imagine systems where constitutional law is really very malleable indeed. And I think one of the points that John made was, well, the the sort of instinct against malleability comes from a very interesting place, doesn't it? It comes from a sort of distrust of democratic institutions in different ways. And so then the question becomes, well, what, why wouldn't you trust democratic institutions? What is it about American democratic institutions where some things need to be written into constitutional texts and not others? And I think a theme that emerged from this morning was that the line between what should and shouldn't be in a constitutional text and thus protected from the whims of a legislature at a particular moment um, is not very clear. It depends very much uh, on sort of particular circumstances in particular moments. You know, people might think uh, in one era that it's very important to have a constitutional rule about lotteries. Because you're very, very interested in lotteries, or but 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 in 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 a, in another era, the question of who gets to vote might not be a question that everybody thinks should be pinned down in a constitutional text. So, one of the things about these very malleable constitutional texts is that they they actually reflect a given era's sense of what is and isn't the kind of question they don't really trust democratic decision-making to decide. Now, whether or not you think that those decisions should then be revisited easily or not depends quite a bit on whether you think that that package of things that should be removed from the ordinary political process is stable or unstable and likely to change across time. And I don't know, in, in Britain, we just don't worry about these things in quite that way. But America has always had written constitutional texts, will always have written constitutional texts, and so we'll always worry about that. We'll always worry about what should and shouldn't be an ordinary part of politics. And I think we'll have an, an unending debate about whether a given constituency's issue is so important that it ought to be in the constitutional text itself. So when I hear people say, oh, there are matters that just 
uh, you know, as a matter of principle, should or shouldn't be in constitutional text. I think that that sort of rather misses most of the American constitutional tradition, at least at state level. Um, and I think malleability, this is a historian's answer, not a political science answer, but it is a fact because Americans have actually not reached a consensus over the last 200 years about what should and shouldn't be the, you know, the ordinary business of politics. Yeah, so there's this important question as to uh, what the correct thresholds are for amendment, and, and that's a normative question. It's, it's a tough one to answer. But we know that the U.S. Constitution has the highest bar to amendments out of any national constitution. You need two-thirds of the states in convention or legislature, and then three-quarters uh, um, or two-thirds of both houses of Congress, and then three-quarters of the states uh, in, in convention or legislature to ratify, rather. Uh, that's the highest bar out of any national constitution in the world. And when you look at national constitutions comparatively, we know this from the Constitute Project, which, which looks at the content of, of constitutions across the world, that the ones that are hard to amend tend to be brittle. Right? They, they break rather than bending it. So the question then is, how has the U.S. Constitution survived for so long? And you can argue the U.S. Constitution is not the same document that was ratified in 1787. For example, uh, Lincoln's New Birth of Freedom points out that the Constitution as it was ratified in 1787 was ratified to protect slavery. It would not have been ratified without a protection of slavery that it existed perhaps solely because of this doc, uh, this uh, protection of slavery, as the historian Mary, um, um, uh, Sarah, Bil uh, Mara, Sarah, Mary Sarah Builder, there we are, uh, has pointed out recently. Um, so, you know, we may not have had uh, kept, uh, we may not have kept that document over, over the years in its exact form, but roughly we have. And one way that we've been able to keep it, again, is by deferring national issues down to the, the state level. Fundamental issues can be resolved through state constitutional reform through amendment or judicial reinterpretation or wholesale constitutional replacement. But what makes this more difficult now, as John pointed out, is that state politics has become polarized. We know this from Dan Hopkins' work, The Increasingly United States, which shows that uh, state legislatures tend to be more polarized. As, as John pointed out, uh, we get single party control more often in, in state legislatures. And so some of this um, uh, sense of, of democratic experimentation, right? this uh, idea that states operate as laboratories of democracy, as, as Justice Brandeis pointed out, some of this is beginning to fade away. And especially in competitive states where Republicans have legislative majorities that are are threatened by sort of popular uh, movements. I'm thinking again here of Ohio State Legislature, which is to the right of the state electorate trying to preempt the state electorate from protecting amendment under its constitution. We see in states like this actually moves against majoritarian democracy, partly through things like gerrymandering and voter disenfran uh, disenfranchisement, and to some degree through election subversion, although some of that has, has sort of failed over the last few years. And so I'm worried now in the present that the state's historical function of, of being able to vent national popular uh, sort of pressures, national pressures for reform, that some of that may be starting to sort of fade and, and that we may be losing this really important mechanism that's preserved the American Constitution for so many years as we see polarization and especially democratic backsliding happening at the state level. But I'd be curious to hear what other people think. I'm going to completely change the question you asked. <laughs> but first, I'm going to thank you for flying so many people out from the East Coast, from across the ocean. When I look out that window, I see a steeple of a church that's located four doors from my house. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you for doing all this work and flying them out. You asked about whether it's good or bad that state constitutions are so easily amended. But we need to separate easily amended from frequently amended. It's true they're more easily amended than the US Constitution, but that's not the primary reason they're more frequently amended. The more frequently amended is there's a greater need for reform because we've filled them up with stuff. And the more you put in those state constitutions, the more they grow obsolete with time because there's all these additional targets for reform. So if you want a sense for how long these get, the US Constitution, prior to any amendments was in the neighborhood of 4,500 words. The shortest state constitutions in New Hampshire and Vermont, I want to say, are roughly that length, but a little longer. You're 100 times longer by the time you get to Alabama. 
Alabama's weird, so we're going to pretend they don't exist. But even when you look at other states, you're getting, you know, Alabama's at 400,000 words, but there's some weird things going on there. But when you look at other states, you're talking about 100,000 words, 80,000, 90,000. This is your Missouri's, Oklahoma's, Texas's. Everybody always assumes California, but they're behind these other states. They get there too. Colorado. You put all this stuff in and you have to make it changeable. And when you do the statistical analysis that John was uh, referring to earlier from my book, and you look and you put in the different mechanisms for amending constitutions, you do find there's a relationship there. If you make it easier to amend, you do get somewhat more amendments. But far and away, the biggest predictor is just the length of that constitution. So is it a good or a bad thing that they're malleable? Well, it would have to be. I mean, you, you, you've had some great uh, legal scholars arguing that around the world, you have two models of a constitution. There's the US model of short and rarely amended. Then there's the many other countries model of long and always amended. And they brought into this discussion the states. And it's not really a choice to have long and not rarely amended, or you're going to rapidly run into a legitimacy crisis. Thank you. Uh, let me follow up. Is there a tension? I mean, we've so we've pointed so far. There seems to be. Uh, I, I mean, my impression is I'd, I'd love somebody to push back on this. A general appreciation of. Um, state constitutions being either in Robinson's words, a sort of outlet, sort of relief valve for American politics making those changes. I mean, maybe whether it's desirable as such or not, it performs important function. Um, or maybe it's it's more in John's telling from his lecture. He, he mentioned Jefferson's argument. I don't know how many people are familiar with this. Jefferson said, look, if uh, if you don't have frequent revisiting of your constitution in a popular process, then it is uh, you know, in actually to borrow terms from Adam's book, in the dead hand's grip. It's, it's like the dead hand of the past ruling a li living generation, and that's undemocratic. Um, and so you need sort of these amendment processes so that you can legitimize and know that your constitution is in fact meeting with the, or is a product of the consent of the people, not just originally, but their ongoing consent. So there are some bases on which we can see we're talking about constitutional amendments being desirable. Um, but if they are, Adam makes a good point. Doesn't that mean they're going to get longer? Can you reconcile these two things? That is, we, we want state constitutions to be accessible to the people and, and easily amendable so that people can express their will and dissatisfaction when those constitutions don't meet with their approval. But there seem to be some real downsides to making constitutions so long. Can anybody square that circle for me or reconcile those things? Nicholas? I, I think it's probably helpful to remember where the impetus for popular amendments came from. And it wasn't really to do with questions of legitimacy. It was out of a worry, particularly actually here in the American West, that state government institutions were too easily captured by big corporate interests, and that the and that the the popular amendment process was, grew out of that worry that um, legislatures, particularly perhaps in in new states, might be very vulnerable to a kind of capture. So I'm not really sure that the sort of the impetus behind. I I, I think you raise really good questions about the justification for a popular amendment process. But I think historically, people weren't thinking, I'm, I'm really willing to be corrected on this, but I, but I don't think people were thinking in those kinds of theoretical terms when these proposals first found their way into state constitutional texts. John, we'll just keep this microphone going. If this is this is a good microphone to use. I guess I, I want to start off at a place where Nicholas was, was taking us to earlier comments. Why did things get so long in the first place? And, and it, it comes from reacting to problems that the public saw things that were not working with government. 
And the leading example and really where things took a turn was in the 1840s. And there was a series of economic recessions in the 1830s. And just to take us a little bit to that history, state legislatures had invested in canals, in roads, in other improvement projects. And then recession hits and a lot of these kind of these projects come crashing down. And in some ways, the state, in some cases, the state had loaned its credit to these corporations. In some state cases, you know, states had invested directly. And some states actually began defaulting on their payments, on their debt payments. And other states said, well, we're not going to do that, but we're going to have to raise revenue significantly. And so taxes started going up. And so that, yes, there were anti-lottery provisions before that point, as early as the 1820s, but really it's the 1840s that things take on the new level. Is that What is it about these legislators that led them to act in a short-sighted fashion? That was their view. They must have acted short-sightedly to kind of not foresee that these investments might go wrong. They were, they were engaging in profligate spending, is what they say, or profligate investment. And so the big thing that step to take in the 1840s and 1850s was let's restrain them in that way. They can't be trusted anymore in this regard. And so that's the origin. When we talk about the modern balanced budget amendments, which are found in two thirds of the state constitutions, they actually stem from these initial provisions in the early 1840s that say the state shall not be able to borrow money. And then at various times also, they, um, around that same time, uh, uh, the public began being concerned that taxation actually was not equal, that, that, that different kind of property was being taxed at unequal rates. And so they began writing in provisions about what we call tax uniformity provisions. And they said this. So by the 1840s, 1850s, we have a whole set of these thou shalt not type of provisions. Thou shalt not start, start a lottery. Thou shalt, and, and the, the lottery provision, just to give the example for there, they say, like, you know, Legislators, they'll just do this thing. They don't have the courage to raise taxes. And so they're just going to kind of start a lottery. We know who's going to play the lottery. It's fascinating to read these debates. 1820s, 1830s, the no lottery folks said, it's going to be the poorer citizens who are going to bear this burden. And it's going to be, we're going to send the message to our citizens that the way you get ahead in life is by playing the lottery and hoping you get rich. Fascinating to read these debates and to kind of see the same debates come up in the modern. So there's the thou shall not do a lottery. Thou shall not borrow money above a certain point. Thou shall not tax unequally. I say all these things because a lot of the length of the Constitution, a lot of the amendment, and Adam does a really uh, helpful job in his book. He's like, so let's just look at it in a given year. So what were the amendments that have passed, say, in 2016 or so? A lot of the amendments are, well, Maybe we can relax the anti-debt, anti-borrowing provision and actually allow money to be borrowed for building a, a, a new, new road of some kind or this new project. Or a lot of the amendments say, I know we have an anti-lottery provision there, but let's allow an exception for bingo games uh, for chari or charitable raffles. And so they have to amend the Constitution to do that. And then whenever someone wants to have a tax break of some kind, they say, oh, maybe disabled veterans should not have to pay full property tax. They have to amend the Constitution to do that because otherwise they have a tax uniformity. So I say this. The story is exactly right that by by putting in these original thou shalt not clauses, but then you, when you change your mind or want to make exceptions later on, you have to go through that process. I suppose the question I've raised is, I would raise is, is that a healthy or an unhealthy way to go about things? You could say, well, that's unhealthy. Just leave that to the ordinary political process and don't make yourself keep going through these hoops to kind of grant exceptions later on. But I could also tell a story about this, a very healthy way to govern, that people decided this is an important commitment to us. And we want to entrench this commitment. In general, we don't want gambling. In general, we don't want borrowing. In general, we don't want unequal taxation. If we want to break that commitment, make us go through a bit of a difficult hoop to get there. Don't let just the legislature just kind of break that commitment. Make us go through that same process that we had to. That would be the positive take to put on. Does that end up getting long in that sense? It does could be said to have its own benefits. So I'll, I'll stop there and, 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 and as I tell that part of the story of how we got these provisions. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, I, you can use the others. 
we'll keep this one at this end of the table and we'll, we'll okay um yeah i think it like in some ways the, i'm the historian on the panel right well nicholas is too but so i'm like way um this is all very interesting but the like counting the length the number of words in a thing is less um is usually like not the not a historical approach in as much as coming at it and thinking like well why are people doing this right and so you know i i think if you told and this is like a right sort of a, a thought experiment but if you told people like you know tell john adams that you know <laughs> Someday, there are going to be all these messy ways of amending state constitutions. Um, you know, it's kind of, there's no uniformity to it, and they're long, and they're, you know, like, there's random stuff in there um, that we wouldn't expect to see in there. Um, I don't think they'd have any problem with that, because they would see it as a sign of vigilance, right, and of... The, and a, a sign of civic, of a deep fabric of civic engagement, right? An entrenched concern with how these different states are governed, each reflecting particular local traditions um, and local customs, right? So I think like there's a, in so many ways there's an under, I, mean, I think like, there really is an underlying stabilization factor that we see even amid what looks like you know, what looks like us today, like a lack of uniformity and, and a cause for concern, that there's a deeper sign of engagement and, and um, it is a relief valve in a lot of ways, right? Like having, and there are ways that people are, I was thinking about be, before you got to it, the, the stuff we see in the 1840s, right? Like I, I finished my book on this because New York has, New York sticks, you know, these, what today, like uh, you know, today read as bizarre provisions in their state constitution in the 1840s, around not making um, not making unrestricted land grants to corporations. Well, why are they doing that? Because the state's on the hook for all these investments and railroads that are going bankrupt left and right. Um, in part because they're they're in part because the legislature is incredibly corrupt, <laughs> right? And they're everybody's on the take. Right, and so what do you suppose, how, what is the only, you know, if you're unable to address, if you're unable to address the problem of legislators selling their offices, right, and they try to do that, there is, there's one impeachment case in the state senate where basically the message is, look, you did this way too openly. We have a great thing going on here, and you are messing it all up by advertising that we're all cor as corrupt as you. Um, and so we're gonna punish you specifically for speaking out, of, you know, for, for being too, um, too blatant, just too, too prominent. Uh, like, what are people, like, there aren't a lot of remedies at hand for that, right? Um, so this is, this is an available means of addressing that. Um, and I think if you look at the, I just, I think if you look at the, um, I mean, what I what I really find interesting is that sort of in the lack of uniformity is the way the degree to which these are really local. You can really see the proximity of the differences in the proximity of state legislatures um, and state courts to their people to their particular localities versus what the federal uh, what national institutions look like, right? And you, and you see a lot of this come up and and sort of the concerns about circuit riding, um, the, the debates over the 1801, 1802, uh, the, the Judiciary Acts, right, those fights. Like, how are, you know, the, the, how is it, and especially concerns about the Supreme Court, like, how are how is such a small number of people gonna hold sway over such a vast territory? Um, that's why I think that, you know, the, I'm really appreciative of, of a lot of the work you have all done up here um, in sort of reminding people, um, because historians have kind of lost the plot on this in some ways, about how important state, state constitutions and state courts are, right, and state institutions are in the way that the, God, the republic is actually governed on a daily basis and held together. 
I just want to introduce one other kind of a topic in here, because when we talk about amendments, and I was saying, oh, some of them are thou, thou shall not pass these policies, and there's thou shalt pass these policies. I want to put in one other product of malleability, or the fact, and that is there's been a lot of, of consideration of the design of governing institutions and a lot of experimentation with the design of governing institutions. So, so some of it is policy matters. But a lot of it is, is the Americans at the state level saying, so if things aren't working so well with the legislature or with the governor, is there a different set of institutions or different institutional design that would work better? And so it's probably, we, we always tell the story, okay, one state has unicameral legislature, it's Nebraska. There were three states in the early republic that had unicameralism, as Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Georgia. Yes, that's, that is the story. But the amount of degree of consideration of adopting a one-house legislature, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It hasn't gone forward. It hasn't succeeded in a lot of places. But there's been a lot of folks in constitutional convention and other ways that have given very serious consideration to and have come pretty close to saying, let's get rid of one of these houses because actually all we get with two houses, we're paying two sets of salaries and we're increasing the chances of gridlock and we're especially increasing the chances of the special interests. If one reads state Constitutional convention debates, one sees a predominant concern with the lobbyists, the special interests. That just gives the special interests one more avenue to prevent the will of the people from being going all the way through and being expressed. And so there's an opportunity to see, is a two-house legislature or a one-house legislature better? How about the way that we structure our judges and our courts? I mean, yes, the, all the states started off with an appointed judiciary. And then they said, well, are there other models? And judicial elections became the norm from the 1840s onward. And then beginning in the 1910s, folks say, yeah, judicial elections, but how about nonpartisan judicial elections? And then by the 1940s, the Missouri plan takes hold where, and it becomes the dominant one of the say, let's have a commission that selects the judges, and then the judges serve them at a time, and then we let the people come and do a yes or no vote. Or even, I'll just give two other examples, how we structure our executive branch. Should it be a long ballot or a short ballot? Is it more, do we hold more accountable our executive officials if we just elect the governor and then let the governor appoint all the other positions of meaning? Some states have done pretty close to that. Or are we gonna get better accountability of our executive branch if the people elect the governor, the attorney general, the lieutenant governor, the labor commissioner, the auditor, the uh, state superintendent, the insurance commissioner, and if they're then popularly elected. States have amended their constitution routinely to try out these experiments, see which ones worked. And the final thing I'll mention is obviously the very experimentation with direct democracy itself. That at the beginning, at, turn, at the turn of the 20th century, folks begin to have doubts about whether representative government is succeeding in all respects. And they say, let's provide an assistance to representative government by providing this other opportunity for the people to put measures on the ballot directly. That then gets adopted in nearly half of the states. So a lot of rightful discussion about policy matters. We haven't talked about rights, of course, but there's another way in which the amendment process has been used to expand rights. But I just want to put in that mix. That's one of the consequences of malleability is to allow the federal level. Now let's add up the number of institutional amendments that we've had in that sense. You know, They tweaked the Electoral College very early on, direct election of senators. We moved the inauguration day for president back a month and a half have not a whole lot else in terms of institutional change is otherwise it's frozen in that sense in the institutional states that's one that's when i would put that as a plus of malleability is to allow that experimentation and one would say in laboratories of experimentation in regard to what kind of institutions you are, you're, you're guided by so let me interject another question um I actually have two, but I'll pick one. Um, this is prompted in part by Robinson's book, Hidden Laws, and I'll repeat the subtitle, How State Constitutions Stabilize American Politics, and a couple of us have used the phrase relief valve, and what that suggests to me is that maybe it's not such a bad thing that we have a disparity between malleability at the state level relatively static 
So, it, well, you either say stable or stale <laughs> at the at the federal level. Um, let's assume for a moment we think, uh, you know, maybe we can make some adjustments in the way we do it. Maybe we should favor conventions. But let's assume for a moment we think that malleability of state constitutions is a good thing. Should we apply a different uh, sort of a different standard to the federal constitution. Does it follow the federal constitution should also be more malleable? Because we've heard complaint. If you've been around since this morning, you know, uh, you know, uh, Judge Sutton some this morning mentioned about you know the, the impossibility of amending the federal constitution. And um, uh, as we've as we've heard, the federal constitution is the most difficult to amend potentially if we consult the constitute project and its comparison of national constitution so if we come to this conclusion about state constitution should we go the whole way and say yeah the federal constitutional order needs to be more malleable too yeah uh, i'll jump in on that so the federal constitution is extraordinarily difficult to amend. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. There have been bursts of amendment between 1913 and 1920. Four amendments passed quickly between, 19, uh, between 1865 and 1873. Radically transformative amendments passed in uh, 1791. 10 amendments passed. So you get these moments in which amendments do pass to the federal constitution, but these are moments in which you get widespread majorities in Congress. Again, you need two thirds of both houses of Congress or uh, two thirds of the states to call a convention, the latter never, never having happened. And then three quarters of the states to ratify in, in um, legislature or convention. These super majorities do happen periodically. They happened after the Civil War when Democrats uh, um, had left uh, um, Congress and, and joined the Confederacy, many of them were uh, refused readmission to Congress. And so you had Republican supermajorities willing to abolish slavery, to pass the transformative reforms of the 14th and 15th Amendment as well. After this exogenous shock of the uh, stock market crash in 1929, Democrats also claimed similar supermajorities, crossing these two thirds th thresholds in Congress, uh, capturing three quarters of the state legislatures. What you see, though, is that this cyclical rhythm in which one party takes supermajorities in the federal and state legislatures and can either amend the Constitution or can stack the Supreme Court to achieve democratic change, that the size of these swings has been decreasing over time. The amplitude has been decreasing over time. And you can observe that just by looking at the size of congressional majorities. For the last few Congresses, we've been dancing around 50%. Democrats, last Congress had a 50-50 split in Congress. They were able to govern, uh, I'm sorry, in the Senate, uh, by, uh, they were able to govern by using uh, Kamala Harris as the VP tiebreaker. Uh, right now, again, we see Republicans with a 51% majority in the House. And this is, again, a stable pattern. What we see is that the majority is necessary to pass federal constitutional change, to amend the Constitution, or to rebuild the Supreme Court through gradual reappointment uh, to achieve federal change. That's no longer happening. And that's really troubling because you periodically do need to update federal law. And so while conceptually it's good to have some malleability in the federal Constitution, we're also in the longest period without amendment. Or I'm, I'm sorry, one of the longest periods without amendment. And then most of you all in this room we're not alive when amendment was passed to the Constitution. And, and y'all may not live to see another one. And that's really, really troubling. So I think some flexibility is necessary, right? The, the amendments that really most improved or the periods that most improved the United States, abolishing slavery, building a welfare state necessary to update the United States, bring it into the 20th century. These things that were, were necessary reforms required the kinds of majorities we don't have anymore. And so this polarization and gridlock we see at the federal level, um, is, is it's not really something that can be counteracted at the state level, right? To some degree, you need transformative federal reform periodically, and we're just not getting the majorities necessary for that anymore. And that really troubles me. Increasingly, we see very narrow majorities in the state level and to some degree at the federal level trying to govern with these hardball and, and increasingly extreme measures as if they have the majorities that they don't. And so again, we see a, a kind of dysfunctional politics now, uh, which shows again that maybe there's need for substantial federal reform in some ways, but we just don't have the kinds of majorities necessary for that. It takes just about as long to fly from Salt Lake to DC as it takes to fly from DC to London. And you know the the scale of the sort of American Union is absolutely enormous. 
And some of the flaws that people perceive in the US Constitution are the compromises dating from the founding that weren't very scientifically created um, that try and balance power and trust across a union of that size. And I wonder what tinkering with some of them would look like even if in a more idealized world, you know, you might have said some of those compromises should have been written a little differently. Maybe there should have been some rules about how many people lived in a state before you, um, uh, you know, accepted states into, into statehood or that kind of provision. But I, I, I think one of the reasons why it is so hard to imagine adjusting some of the features of the US federal constitution is that the things that people are most frustrated by um, have to do with that distribution of power that was designed to create a confidence in a union of this scale. I also wonder whether some of the dysfunction at federal level is really something that would be easily fixed in a constitutional text. A lot of the dysfunction at federal level, it seems to me, have to do with the rules that Congress have decided you know, internally to adopt that have very little to do with any provision that you would find anywhere in a, st in a state or federal constitutional text. Um, so in a way, you know, Congress has made it very hard for itself to operate. It's very hard to see how a convention process or any other amendment process is really going to adjust that. So I, I don't know, I'm not as pessimistic about the stability of the federal constitution as, as some people might be. Um, partly because I think actually one of the things that it has done, with the notable exception of a civil war, um, is hold together a really remarkably diverse union, albeit through some pretty imperfect compromises that have not worked out the way that somebody like John Adams might have imagined. Um, but, I, but I wonder what tinkering with them would really look like. The, the constitutional text itself contains relatively few policy provisions, so it doesn't hit that test of needing amending because it writes in particular policy provisions in the bare letter of the text, although the Supreme Court has for about 100 years thought otherwise on quite specific issues. But no, I'm not as pessimistic, and I think the, the balance between malleability at state level and stability at federal level has served America quite well. Adam, you had something there? Yeah, it's an interesting question. How do you evaluate it? So the question is, would, is it better, is it worse for the US Constitution to be amended so seldom? And, and we've had some good responses reflecting on how that might affect policy and governance. Let's take a different angle. How would it affect what we think about it? Um, and this is an argument that's gone on since the founding. James Madison was very close with Thomas Jefferson once he got after his brief infatuation with Hamilton. But one thing they always disagreed about was whether you should be having a stable constitution or one you amend regularly. And that persists today. So just imagine for a moment that you could send a survey to every American, ask them a few questions. Do you know anything about your state constitution? You're going to learn they don't you're going to learn that half of them don't even know their state has a constitution. I know this because I've done this survey. And then suppose that you uh, have, that's your control group, and then in your treatment group, you also ask them to evaluate their state constitution, but you first tell them just a few things about it. You tell them that it's amended at a much higher rate than the U.S. Constitution. You tell them the year it was adopted, and you compare that to 1787. And in that group, you're going to find they report liking their constitution more than in your control group where you didn't give them this information and they had no idea that it was more adopted and younger. And in fact, and we did this study with real information, and in the states where respondents uh, had a constitution that was particularly younger or particularly more amended, their approval went even higher. I don't know if this carries to the U.S. Constitution because we did similar questions asking about the U.S. Constitution and then giving them information, and they didn't budge in their views because their views had nothing to do with the substance of that document. They don't know what's in it anyway. Their views had to do with its link in their minds to the founding. And so when they think of the U.S. Constitution, they think, yeah, I approve of this thing because they're connecting it to warm, fuzzy events in their minds about their American identity. I don't know what would happen 
if this would carry over or not. But at least in the States, we find they say they like it better. They approve of it on a variety of metrics. In a follow-up study I'm working on now, we did something similar, and we find they approve of judicial review more often. We give them a scenario as opposed to court struck down this provision. And for some of them, we're telling these things. They say, oh, yeah, this is I, I approve of this more. Or we give them a scenario and say, here's the specific issue, and here's the provision they used. And in this one, it was hypothetical, and we randomized whether we told them the provision had been adopted in this year or another. And if we said it was a lot more recently, they're like, oh, I approve of this striking down. So this is all suggestive, but I have no idea whether it would carry over to the US Constitution or not. And by the time we've done the actual experiment someday and find out, who knows what will be going on in this country otherwise. You make me think of something that I, I, I can't resist adding. Every time there's been a constitutional convention in America, an actual convention, not a piecemeal amendment, it has been an occasion for some of the most creative thinking on, in, in American political thought. The Federalist Papers, which are you know the most remarkable piece of political theory to come out of the American Revolution, were occasioned by a constitutional convention. They, they weren't, you know detached from it, they were because of it. At state level, whether it's the 19th century or the 20th century, every time the state has held a constitutional convention, there has been a broad public education campaign, there have been public debates about you know, basic political principles, there have been um, editorials in newspapers, there have been uh, things published for schools. You know, the constitutional conventions have been a really important moment for the American public to re-engage with um, sort of questions of political theory. They've been really important moments for some really new thinking to be done uh, on questions of political thought. Uh, and, I, and I wonder whether, John, just to add the things that might have been lost in losing convention processes, actually America has lost these, what used to be very frequent opportunities for this kind of um, public exercise in political philosophy. I'll just add to that, and this, this obviously a lot of students here and part of the Quilt Project are obviously know this inside and out, but the, the, the newspaper and public coverage of conventions when they took place, I mean, you wanted your reporters there, not just describing you know, the, the headlines of what happened, but reprinting the speeches and the debates, that says that the public was interested in that. You're not going to fill your newspaper with that if there's not public command, demand for that. And there was in that way. So just to, to illustrate that point that Nicholas was making. I want to ask one or two more questions, and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, but one of these is we, we've talked a lot about the virtues of constitutional conventions as opposed to, uh, and I think the best, best catch all for this might be piecemeal um, amendment processes. And I wonder uh, what might be some of the virtues of piecemeal amendment processes? Uh, I think we've touched on this a little bit. I've heard it come into the conversation sort of, uh, you know, in a, in a very subtle way. But I wonder if anyone has anything to say about you know, the, the, the virtues of actually being able to tackle very specific changes in a very public, maybe you say plebiscitary way that references the public directly, uh, assembling voters rather than relying on a deliberative convention. Just on one very quick thing on this, and I alluded to it briefly, but the issue of cost is a major one, that whenever we have one of these convention questions go before the public, and um, you know, we, I, we've studied these matters, is what happens sometimes, this, these questions, as I say, in some states they go before the public every 20 years, in some states they go before the public every 10 years, in Michigan they go before the public every 16 years, interesting enough. So we get a regular chance to kind of see what happens, in the, in the, and we oftentimes see actually the yes side winning in early public opinion polls, is that people say, oh, maybe this is the time that we see a convention called. And then we get to the final few weeks and we say, well, what are the concerns that people raise about these conventions? And people say, look, we've got our own ways of changing our constitution. It's through the amendment process. The last thing you want to do is have 70 million, 100 million or more dollars spent 
on a convention. And that is a powerful argument. That, along with the Pandora's box argument, is I don't want to open everything up. I just want to have this one particular change. But I just want to put that cost issue up front and center. Because when, when, when we get to see like what seems to prove persuasive to some voters, that moves them away from a probably a soft yes early in the campaign, but moves them to a no. One of the things that moves that is, do we really need to be spending all this money on all that's required for a convention when we could just pass a constitutional amendment? I think the most appealing thing in, in John's defense of piecemeal amendments was the idea of keeping institutions more in line with the public mood, you know, re reversing decisions that were unwise and so on. And I find that very compelling unless and until institutions decide that they're maybe not going to be corrected by the public. You know, what, what happens when the public in a particular state pass an amendment that maybe the legislature just doesn't like? Um, and does that then start to bring the whole process into disrepute at a whole new level? What will happen when the voters try and overturn a court judgment and the courts say, well, actually, no, we just don't. Agree. So, so I think there's a, and these are not necessarily hypothetical points. So I don't want to name particular states, but um, you know, th these are. This is currently a live issue in some places where voters have very clearly said something, and um, legislatures and executives have said, "Well, we just don't like that answer." And I, I, I worry that there's a ticking time bomb to use your phrase there as well with legitimacy. But I, I, am, I do find the general point compelling that maybe this is a mechanism to keep institutions more in line with the public mood. So to Nicholas's point, I think one advantage of having quick responsive, or one, one advantage of having piecemeal state constitutional amendment is that it allows uh, faster response, especially to unpopular federal reforms, especially to unpopular federal uh, judicial decisions. And so I'll compare, not on normative grounds, just on, on, on sort of empirical grounds, the response to Dred Scott and the response to the Dobbs decision, both very unpopular, right? Uh, Dred Scott, we know from the work of Mark Graber, for example, a legal historian, unpopular throughout the North. Northern state constitutions, which then did not uh, largely have uh, the uh, widespread use of the uh, initiative, uh, were not able to quickly adjust to the system set up under Dred Scott. And while there's some statutory response and some gubernatorial and executive resistance to Dred Scott, it wasn't clearly authorized. And so you get this position in which state governments under their own constitutions are not clearly authorized to resist something that the public wants them to resist. Dobbs, unpopular at the state level. We know from stratified stamp, uh, sampling that uh, there's a simple majority in favor of, of upholding Roe in every state, which is a, a really unusual kind of uniformity in American politics. Over 50% in every state uh, favored upholding Roe. Uh, from stratified sampling over the last couple of years. So Dobbs is, is fairly unpopular at the state level, we can, we can surmise. Um, and what we get now that we have state constitutional amendment, uh, um, especially through the initiative process being uh, accessible, is that you get constitutional authorization of voter response to federal judicial decisions that are unpopular at the state level. You get faster response that's authorized under the state constitutions and doesn't create the kind of ambiguity uh, as to whether um, uh, state officials uh, are, are authorized to uh, counter, uh, counteract federal measures, at least under state constitutions, you get some pushback um, uh, against federal uh, judicial decisions. That, and that can be done, again, through piecemeal state constitutional reform. I want to make, a, make an observation, and then we'll, we'll move to, um, to some questions from the audience. Um, from the perspective of political thought, political theory, one of the things that strikes me in listening to this, uh, and Adam referenced this, a thing that Madison says in the Federalist Papers in response to a sort of um, uh, clamor for popular control of laws and so forth, he makes the observation at one point that the distinction between ancient constitutions, ancient democracies, and modern republics, he says, is the exclusion of the people in their collective capacity from all share in the powers of the government in modern republics. 
And uh, it strikes me in listening to this that we may have lived through, may still be living through a serious shift from the republicanism of the founding in early 19th century, which wanted us to rely on insti representative institutions to deliberate, conventions to deliberate, legislatures to deliberate, to a much more salutary view of direct democracy. <laughs> and what we may really be talking about is not just constitutional amendments, but the whole theory of representative government. Do we still hold to Madison's view that the making of laws and the making of constitutions is best done by representative individuals who are gathered together in a deliberative body who, unlike voters, have to look each other in the eye? If you're a voter and you don't like the other side and you demonize them, you can completely ignore them and stay in your echo chamber, show up at the polls and cast your vote in favor of your prejudice, your side, team blue or team red, and pay no attention to the other side. You actually cannot do that in a deliberative body. You have to confront those who disagree with you. And the conviction of of the, the preponderance of the founding generation seemed to be that's the best way to make laws. That deliberative process and the people are confined to choosing those who represent them in that process. And I think we have very significantly moved away from that conception of Republican government, which means we might be quite justified in the way that we now use the term democracy as the best form of government when the framers very much preferred reference to a republic. Um, and this, I, I think until we had this conversation, it did not strike me. I always thought of the movement for direct democracy to be a sort of episode in American history. And then we'd kind of gone back to our institutions. But I'm not convinced. I don't know if other people have thoughts on this. You want to chime in on it. Um, but it seems to me a significant change in the public mind in the way that Americans think of good constitutional government. Is it representative Republican government or direct democracy? John, you, you threw up a hand there. Yeah, let me just use it. Um, so let me just pick up that, that idea of direct democracy could be seen as this episode that comes around in the progressive era. And, and um, one of the things to do is to look at actually the precursors of voter initiative processes actually came as early as say the 1820s or 1830s, 1840s, when legislators began referring questions directly to voters. And sometimes they do this on controversial questions, but sometimes they believe that that would endow the decision with more legitimacy if the public had a chance to weigh in. And so when it comes to the progressive era, the turn of the 20th century, and we get the move South Dakota as the first state to say, hey, how about if we let voters actually initiate measures, those, those folks could build on. They say, we're already allowing people to vote on things that the legislature believes that would be helpful for them to do so. So at the state level, we have long seen, a, I, I, I think I agree with the way you put things, a rejection of the way that Madison would have put that in there. States have been moving away from that in a lot of ways. It's also the case that I just kind of add one more point. States could be seen as much more as, as, as much more majoritarian and responsive bodies in many ways than the federal government. I'm just going to go one more thing. Nicholas raised the question. He said, we know isn't a lot of the challenges of governing at the federal level responsibility for internal rules, such as the filibuster rule at the Senate, the 60 vote rule. So the question comes up of do states have filibuster rules or is that something that's absent? And about five states actually have supermajority quorum rules. You've seen the walkouts where exactly it's in a sense, in essence, a filibuster because a minority can say, we don't have the majority, but we're just going to leave the chamber in that way. So about five states have that. And about six states do actually have filibuster extended debate rules where they do it. But those are the exceptions. So in so many ways, state governments are designed in ways to seek the public voice, to add to request it, to allow the public to speak directly, and then to in, ensure in many ways that the rules of the, of the chamber are more majoritarian than super majoritarian. Okay. Really easy to forget that, I'll make it real quick. I yeah. think it's just really easy to forget that for 
a vastly long period of time after the American Revolution, public officials, elected officials, state governments, local governments are intensely worried about their own sense of legitimacy. They're constantly trying to find ways to make their existence and continued existence just look justifiable and be taken as legitimate. And that is a, a, a persistent worry, like a real fear um, long into the beginning of the, long into the 19th century, right? That there's this profound sense that they will be perceived as illegitimate and they're doing it. So there's always this, this voice in the back of their minds telling them that they have to seek, I think that, you know, that you can, you can let things, you know, you, they're, they're, they don't feel this way about corruption, particularly, in ways that are surprising. But um, if you look at things like early antitrust or anti-monopoly sentiment, um, the ways that corporate, you know, uh, public and corporate, um, um, uh, free and cor general incorporation laws, um, they're, they're sort of, they're very sensitive to areas where they're being perceived as uh, eroding their own legitimacy and they're responding to that um, constantly. I want to take what time we have left to solicit some questions from the audience. So as in our previous sessions, we've got students with microphones. Does anyone have questions they want to direct to the panel? Just one over here. Thank you for a very insightful uh, discussion. My question has to do with uh, values, I suppose. Um, we've talked about republics and democracies, but the, the founders really viewed that a general diffusion of knowledge was necessary for these sort of processes to actually even occur. So it's sort of a preceding uh, nece necessary uh, that, that is in place. And my question is, uh, you know, what threats do you see that would disrupt the processes that are necessary for that general diffusion of knowledge. Um, I mean, AI is something that hasn't been discussed. How, how would that come into any sort of future projections of how we might see state constitutions or even federal, the federal constitution be uh, impacted that way? That's just one, but there's, there's others, I'm sure. I'll be... That's, one. That's the hot mic. I'll be really quick. Um, I'm old enough to remember when the, the internet was young and everybody said, this is great. Public debate is going to be elevated. Ignorance is going to be impossible. It's going to be so easy to fact check everything that politicians won't get away with lying anymore. There will be general knowledge about laws being passed. The public is going to scrutinize spending. This is amazing. Governments all over Europe and in America are worried about the way that public debate is being manipulated by automatically generated content run out of server farms, controlled by people that are hostile to the idea of democratic debate. Nobody has a good answer to that problem. But it turns out that the sort of early view that the, the internet would actually facilitate a very active and serious um, and, and sort of intellectually rigorous political process has not at this hour been borne out. In fact, um, I don't know whether it's worse, but it's certainly not as good as it was hoped to be. That seems to me to be a major threat to um, democratic debate, whatever your constitutional arrangements are. Robinson, you had something to add? So we know that voters are rationally ignorant 
most of y'all have a party identification. You know which party you identify with more in this country, although I would guess very few of you can actually fully describe to me the platform that that party gave in 2020 if you're a Democrat or 2016 if you're a Republican. Last time Republicans uh, adopted their party platform. And that's actually pretty rational. I, as a political scientist, can't name either party's full platform, right? They're, they're fairly long, right? About a dozen pages. There's no reason to know the whole content of a party platform. You use a party ID as a heuristic to guess which party is closer to your views. Uh, so th this is what we call rational uh, uh, ignorance. Now, um, again, American democracy can actually function pretty well on ignorance. Only about 52% of Americans know state constitutions exist. I hope it's higher in this room. But that number has been really stable over time. Jim Zink, a, a political scientist at uh, North Carolina State University, found that over 30 years, that number has been about stable. But in Ohio, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, Voters knew the state constitution existed, and they might forget that, but when it becomes politically salient over a really important issue, people learn. And so we actually have a pretty functional republic with a pretty uninformed populace, right? And that, that makes sense, right? You've got a lot of things to worry about in your life besides what's happening in your state constitutions. But when it matters, you'll know. Right. And so I, I think we actually can be functionally ignorant, or so far we have been. And I'm not super worried that, that we're getting dumber. Adam. Uh, that was an answer beautifully consistent with political science where we are today. I, I would add two brief thoughts to that. The, the, the only reason I would worry about that going, the first thought is about the public, the second is with those who write the amendments. The only reason I would worry uh, about what Robertson said going forward is that there we see a concerted effort to make us confront things that force us to think uh, less. There's a concerted effort to not make us have to think critically in our schools. So worry about that. Um, the other angle I would take to the question is thinking about, are we able to spot bad amendments? Um, to their credit, voters ratify fewer initiated amendments than legislative referred ones. And if you're familiar with the political science research, you know why I give that as a credit. Uh, initiated amendments don't go through a negotiating process, a committee process, a process where two chambers have to agree first, a study process aided by staff. Initiated amendments are typically written by some interest group, and they're nearly always inadequate compared to the legislative referred ones. And to their credit, voters notice the difference, and they ratify them at much lower rates. There can still be a role for initiatives as a safety valve when there is something the legislature is not willing to do and the public wants. Another way to think about this, too, though, is thinking about the processes we use to write them. And we can improve those. So probably the best era here, let's go into Utah for a moment. The best era we've had in Utah in looking at our Constitution since it was written in 1995 was a period in the 70s and 80s when we realized that we had hardly touched our state Constitution since it was written for over half a century. And it was getting out of date. And the legislature created a constitutional revision commission. It was dominated by appointees from the House, from the Senate, from the governor, and then the commission would add its own appointees. And they would study one article at a time in depth. And they couldn't just put it on the ballot like the Florida Commission. They had to send it back to the legislature. But through this process, when this was created in 1969, 80% of the original 1895 text was still in the Constitution, 80%. 20 years later, only 40% of the original text was still there because one article at a time, they would study it in depth and send this to the voters. So in part, my response to the question is, let's make sure we keep as voters learning how to think critically, but in part, it's also, if we're going to rely on piecemeal amendments, let's think about the ways we can make those as good as possible and the ways that we study them and prepare them to make them uh, consequential and comprehensive. I think we might have time for one quick question. If somebody's got a burning question they want to ask. Did I see a hand? I feel like an auctioneer. I see a hand, I see a hand. There we go. Um, yeah, this is just kind of like an interesting question, I think. Um, but how, um, if there's a practical method to this, can we use state constitutions in the fostering of um, cultural identity in order to um, possibly bring unity where party divides are separating people? Um, because I know in Utah at least, 
um, there's a lot of Utah centric identity, whereas in some other states it's much more divided on party lines. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about how state constitutions can tie in or if we should be trying to have stronger state identities. Okay. So I think how, how can constitutions form a basis for cultural unity that transcend partisan divides? Is that a fair rendition? Well, the process of writing them, as I think several of us have said, has historically been a great moment for people to, uh, to, to sort of come together and think as a community. But I, I, I don't think difference within a political community is necessarily a bad thing at all. I think that the political process is about managing disagreement. And I think sometimes some of this debate becomes a little bit too focused on well, why don't we all agree as opposed to actually the fact that most of the time in most of America differences are settled without violence. And that even though they're quite profound. And uh, I, I would celebrate that fact myself rather than look to sort of erase difference. John, we'll give you the last word. I would just say that there are a number of constitutional amendments that go on the ballot that actually secure extraordinary ratification rates, suggesting a degree of consensus that's, that crosses the, the aisle. Uh, just to give examples, there are New York State just uh, added a right to a clean and healthful, env healthful environment to its constitution just two years ago um, and passed pretty, uh, pretty strong majorities. There are various states that have added rights to data privacy provisions to their state constitutions. That is, they're concerned about uh, uh, their data, or electronic communications not being private. Those get pretty strong supports. So one of the things that the malleability, to take us back to the beginning of the panel, the very first question, one of the advantages of malleability that is being open and accessible to amendments is allowing when emerging rights come to grab to command a consensus those can be explicitly written into the Constitution and those are just two examples of examples of clean and healthful environment which has been added to a number of constitutions in recent years data privacy that seems to cross a lot across party lines in notable ways well with that I would like to thank our panel for coming today to talk with us about this And I want to thank all of you for being here uh, to say a couple of concluding words. This is the last session today. We will be resuming tomorrow morning with a large uh, keynote talk from Judge Jeff Sutton um, over in the uh, Student Center Ballroom. Um, that will be attended by somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 high school students, in addition to all of you who wish to join us. Um, I also want to say, please do visit our events page at the Center for Constitutional Studies. We have a uh, civic educator event coming up. If you know any educators who uh, would like to think about civic thought and leadership, uh, think about forming citizens, um, we also have in the spring our First Amendment Conference. You'll soon be seeing details on our events page about that, uh, which will be on the subject of the rights to assembly and free association. Uh, so I would invite you back to some of our other events and invite you back tomorrow. Thank you for being with us and have a wonderful evening.